sharp in the morning. Some of you didn't know that come twice on Saturday, did you? 8 o'clock. It's an a.m. and a p.m. So if you come and help us in the morning, that'd be a real blessing. We'll get through just as quick as we can. we got to take this tent back down to Fort Lone, South Carolina tomorrow. So if you come and help us, that'd be a real blessing. Let's have, we'll start with a word of prayer, but let's mention a couple of requests. L. Reed had that they had her surgery, uh, colon surgery, and they moved about a foot of her colon, but they think they got all of it confined to that one area. She didn't have any any uh, uh, lymph nodes that had any signs of cancer in them. So we just thank the Lord for that. So keep her in your prayers so she recovers. And then Hope's mother had a kidney removed just the other day. It was cancerous. They said it was confined to that one kidney. So she's doing good and already at home and doing well. Pray for Miss Nettie Epley and pray for uh, Sandy Behemer. And continue to pray. Glad to have Brother Bruce and Barbara with us tonight. Brother Bruce's uh, sister's funeral was uh, the other day. And uh, we pray for that family as they still in agreement for what a wonderful service and testimony that lady left behind for Jesus. So I'm glad to, glad I told Brother Bruce, I said, I thoroughly enjoyed the funeral. I really did. So uh, you pray for all these requests and pray the Lord's will be done tonight. And pray that we'll see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. And Brother Jarvis will preach like he's never preached before. He's preached good the last few months. Great messages. I praise the Lord for it. Let's stand if you would, please. We'll go to the Lord in word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord's blessing to be upon the request and also upon the service tonight. And just pray that everything that's said and done will be done for the Lord's glory and for His praise. I'm going to ask Brother Nathaniel if he would. Nathaniel, if you'd pray for us, please. stop at night. The Lord can continue the revival in our hearts and stir it in our, in our minds for weeks, months, even years to come. We're going to sing the uh, revive us again tonight. I know it's the last night. We're going to sing it on the first night, but I pray tonight that God will continue to revive his people, continue to revive this church. Amen. We're we'll sing the first and the last verse, revive us again. <laughs> Revive 
with his sword to be walking in his footsteps when I stumble will be understand. He picks me up, walks on my sin, he puts me on my feet again. Yes, he loves me as small as I am. Well, I'm nobody special, I'm no ruler or king, and this old world doesn't know who I am. Yeah, Jesus walks right beside me, fights my battles and gaps me, yes, he loves me.
with drops of blood in the garden wasn't enough. It took more than just a drop or two, took the shedding of it all. Where would man be the day? Was it for that cross? Or it took more than just a single drop? It was long for the
good this week. That thing had a trip one time. If it goes out, we know what to do. We're going to flip it again. Amen. Amen. I appreciate Brother John and his family being with us. That's always a blessing to our heart. And uh, thank you so much, Brother John, you and your family for coming. I always enjoy hearing those good songs that uh, John Carl writes. Uh, that's a great message and what a blessing. We're honored tonight to have the Dix family with us. And we're going to have these young people come on up and sing for us. They were with us just a few weeks ago. We support them. They're missionaries. Uh, their mom is here tonight. Their dad is already back in uh, the Philippines. Uh, but we appreciate these young people. They really blessed our heart. We want them to sing for us tonight. And they came all the way from Lexington uh, to sing for us tonight. So you pray for them and pray the Lord and bless them and use them in a special way. And pray that God will just uh, touch them in a special way. And they will be touched and will be helped. They'll, they will sing for us. They'll just go right ahead. I think everything's set up for them. Um, good evening, everyone. It's so good to be back. Um, before we start, I just want to thank the Lord for saving me and for everything is done. I'm so I thank the Lord for the blood he has shed on Calvary and has cleansed my sins away. And this first song we're going to be singing is The Blood Says You Can. Price has been paid. 
Baby 
that message like out of Calvary. Just a few. Hey, that might be what it means. Or about me telling us something. Amen. Like out of Calvary. He preached that message total darkness. Might be what Brother Jarvis might have to do tonight. But you got a good memory, Brother Jarvis. But listen, these things actually after we take the offering. Brother Jarvis comes up here during his introduction. I want to try to switch that thing around it out there and try to get going. But listen, if it goes out again, just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. He's got light up here. This platform's got power. He's got light up here. Just leave it alone. We give it time to cool down. And when the service is over, we'll turn the lights on so everybody can get out all right. And that keeps everybody from running out and being distracted. The devil will do anything. He'll do anything to try to distract the work. We're not going to let him have the victory, man. We'll preach in the dark, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's have the ushers to come forward. Doug offers down here two young people. We're going to let the six family sing for us while we take the offering instead of everybody coming up and taking their places back again. I walked up here a moment ago on the platform. I said, good gracious, we got enough instruments up here to start a pawn shop. <laughs> Amen. I appreciate these young people. They've been a blessing. And we don't get to hear them ever often. We can get Brother John and them back all the time. Amen. But these folks will be up in the Philippines for too long. We won't get to get them back. And I do appreciate them coming. I appreciate their... They're upon this. I, I just feel God on these kids. I really do. I just feel the Lord on these young ones. Well, I, they probably like to call young ones. These young people. I just feel the Lord on them. I really do. And I appreciate them so much. So you pray for them as they sing during the offertory hymn, and you pray God would use them for his glory. Let's ask the Lord's blessing to be upon it. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your goodness. Blessing this offering. Bless the Lord the uh, service. Thank you, Lord, for what we've heard. Thank you, Lord, for Brother John and his family. Thank you for the Dick's family. Thank you for Brother Jarvis and his family and the folks that are here tonight from his church. Lord, just bless and give us a great time. Father, help the power to stay on. Help us not to have any more problem with the lights or a problem with going out. But Lord, I pray that you will just speak to us tonight and help us to just to keep our eyes focused upon you. We'll give you praise for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jarvis, you come on preach to us, brother. We hopefully will like to hold up. If they don't, we just want to let brother, we've got plenty of light up here, and we'll still have the light, and uh, we're just going to just let him preach, amen. And uh, God knows what's best. Let's just pray that no devil will stay out of the light system, amen. Brother Jarvis, good to have you tonight, brother. to get situated here. Um, I've preached in the dark before with a flashlight, and I think I can handle it again tonight with the help of the Lord. And I've even brought my flashlight. <laughs> this ain't my first rodeo, friend. I've been around a day or two. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and take my coat off. I don't normally do that, but I'm not tough as brother, brother Mary Spears. <laughs> I appreciate that message he preached on to you tonight. You can be turning in your Bible tonight to the book of James, chapter 4. <clears throat> I want to say again how much of an honor it is for me to be with you folks this week. I've enjoyed it. Good liberty to preach. I did feel a little better when I got up this morning. <clears throat> um, I wish I had felt, I wish I felt better through the nights of this week, but the Lord knows, and I feel like the Lord has helped us, and I give Him the glory for that. James chapter 4. I just couldn't get away from this passage of Scripture. So I feel this is what the Lord would have us to deal with here tonight. Um, we have a Reformers Unanimous program going on at the church tonight, and some of our folks have been away, or are away, my children included, down there helping with that program. But I appreciate each one of you being here, and I appreciate you, you for lack of a better term, making it easy on me to preach. I believe that a lot of the preaching is in the congregation. You can make it easier or you can make it tough. And I've been in a few places where I'd rather been fishing, just to be honest with you. Um, no, that don't sound spiritual, but that's just the truth. Uh, but I appreciate your reception to the Word. I believe with all of my heart that the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and makes the child of God more like the Son of God. This Bible, if it gets in us and we'll hear it and heed it, it will transform us. It will have an impact in all of our lives. 
We need the hand of God in our lives in this day. The preacher talked about this singing group having the, the touch of God on them. And they're, they're young people. I, I don't know their ages for sure, but I'm sure they're younger than I am. And, um, and, and I thought, you know, there's nobody in this building that can't have the hand of God in your life. If you're old enough to be saved, you're old enough to be spiritual. You're old enough for God to touch your life and use you mightily. I think about those through the scripture. I think about young David comes to mind. I think about Daniel and others. At a, just a young age, God's hand was upon them and with them, and uh, they were used of God mightily. And that kind of goes along with the uh, message tonight, I guess. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll read the text and get into saying what we feel like the Lord has to say to them. All right, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we bow before you once again tonight, thanking you and praising you for what you've done here already this week. I thank you, Lord, for the, the conviction, the, the moving and working of the Spirit of God that I have sensed during the invitation periods this week. And I pray that once again tonight, Lord, that folks would have their mind and affections upon you and your word and your truth. And I pray your spirit would take your word and apply it, fit and form it to the need of every heart tonight. Give me wisdom through the course of the message. And I pray your power would set down on this place for your glory and you would change us in these days. God, I pray that we would go away different than we came into this place tonight. Father, I beg you for your glory and honor that you'd do something special in this place, even tonight, Lord. Let true revival begin in me, Lord, in me tonight, and if in no one else, God. But I pray, God, it would begin right here tonight in us. And for what you do, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. James chapter 4 and verse number 1. <clears throat> From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That is strong language. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God, or to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And I'm going to stop there. Now let us remember in this passage of Scripture, as strong as this language is, it is written 
to saved people. He's writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. He calls them brethren in chapter 1, verse number 2. And I am convinced that the passage before us, and in fact the book of James is, primarily, and I understand there's application everywhere, but primarily it is written to save people, and yet there is such strong language here. Let's look at it, first of all, from verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? And then he talks about even of lust that war in your members. He tells us that, that the war on the outside, all of the wars that we see on the outside today, the, the, the cause of them lies on the inside. We got war in the world today because there are there is a war going on on the inside of mankind. And you understand that there is wars and fightings even sometimes, unfortunately, inside the church people. And that's caused because there's problems on the inside. There's battles. There's a war going on on the inside. These wars and fightings come from the lust that war in our members. So there is a warfare that's a problem that's going that's being talked about talked about here. And there's nobody in this building that doesn't face that saved that doesn't face a, a battle on the inside. A war that's going on. There, there's that, that problem, that old nature that's still there. I promise you. That old nature, he's, he's still there. And there's a battle that goes on on the inside of us. But then I want you to notice he deals with the problem of our walks. He talks about the lust that war in our members. In verse 2, you lust and desire to have, or and have not, you kill. And he said, and desire to have. And then verse 3, that you may consume it upon your lust. So there are uh, these lusts and these desires to have. And, and just because you get saved doesn't mean that that goes away. There's problems that we face every day. In fact, if we could get rid of these problems, we could, man, we could really do good for God. I believe that's the struggle the Apostle Paul had when he said, Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body this day? I believe he's talking about a struggle that's going on inside of him. And he goes on to talk to about the worldliness that we face in verse number four. The adulterers and adulteresses know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, is the enemy of God. Such strong language. But how many people attend churches and, and yet they're still friends with this world? That is a, a dividing line. He's drawing it tight. And I mean, he's saying if you're a friend of the world, I, you can't. You're an enemy of God. It's like being. It's like saying I love babies and I love abortion. They're on opposite ends. You can't love both at the same time. And yet the devil has deceived multitudes into thinking that somehow you can you can live in the world and live like the world and. And, and follow back to the world and be a friend of the world and still have the hand of God in your life. But that's a deception. And James is drawing it tight. And I'm going to be honest with you as we think about this, as I said a few minutes ago, I dare say there's not a one of us that, do, that's, that, that does not experience some of these struggles in us. I mean, you've got to be careful in this day with the lusts of the flesh. 
Everywhere you go, people's half dressed. You can't even stand in line at Walmart without the magazines of half dressed women on the cover of the magazine and have to turn your head. Why do you turn your head? Because if you're not careful, that old nature, that old man will rise up and you'll start thinking things you ought not be thinking. You say, I don't have no problem with that. I think you're lying. I'm just being honest. It's a struggle that we all face. Whatever it may be, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, whatever it may be, there are battles that we face. There are problems uh, that come up against us. And we say, man, if I could just get rid of that thing, if I just didn't have any problem with that thing, I'd be good to go. And we could enjoy the power and the presence of God all the time. But, but these problems are in us. And we struggle with them. Which brings me to verse number six. But, he said, he giveth more grace. And I found it interesting that these young people just sang about how there's nothing greater than what? And we sing about amazing. You know what he's telling us tonight? That by the grace of God, you and I can overcome these battles, these problems, these difficulties, that God's grace is sufficient to help us live for him and please him and do that which is honoring him with our life. It is possible by the good grace of God to please God and have the hand of God in our life. That's exciting to me. As bad as it is, as tempting as it is, you young people, I, boy, I just, I'd love to really, to, to God to just put something in some young person's heart tonight. We need some Davids in this day that step out there and say, what? Is there not a cause? I'd like to preach on that a while tonight. You know why I think he said that? You know why? He, he, he asked this question. And they told him what would be done to the man that slew the Philistine. And his question was, what shall be done? It's not because he didn't understand what they said. I think what David was saying was, you mean to tell me that the king's got to pay somebody to go kill that rascal? You mean to tell me he's got to give him his daughter and this, that, and the other to go kill that rascal? Is there not a cause other than getting paid for it? There's a cause tonight for you and I to have the hand of God in our lives. And we can, by the grace of God, overcome. And you young people can live for God at college. You can live for God at school. You live for God in the midst of the rest of this wicked world. In spite of what they say, by the grace of God, you can overcome these problems that we face. You say, preacher, you just don't know what I'm facing. I was young once. I know it's hard for you to believe that with all this gray hair in my head. But I was young one time. I know what it's like. I told you a little bit about what I used to be involved with last night. I was a lifeguard all the time. I mean, that was my job. That's what I got paid to do. Don't tell me there's not struggles. I know about the struggles out there. I know about the difficulties. I know the things that you face in this life, but I'm telling you, there is overcoming grace. And now we begin in verse number seven then. Well, let me just, before I get to that, no, I'll get to that later. Verse number seven. I believe he said there, submit yourselves therefore. Now the word therefore connects what has been said with what's being said. And verse 6 he says. He giveth more grace. God resisteth the proud. But giveth 
grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore. I believe what he is doing is he is beginning to give us a, a few points on how or who it is, I guess I should say, on who it is that God will bestow this overcoming grace on. It's not for everybody. This grace that will help you overcome those wars and those wants and that worldliness, this grace that is much able to help you overcome the, the difficulties that you face, he doesn't give it to everybody. So then if I were there in your shoes tonight, my next question would be then, preacher, who does he give it to? Then, preacher, how do we give that? I hope if I were to ask you tonight how many of us in this under this tent, I started saying this building, I'm used to preaching in the church. How many of you under this tent tonight really would like this overcoming grace? really would like God's grace to fall upon you in such a manner that it wouldn't matter what the world does. It wouldn't matter if they started locking us up. And by the way, we know that what I'm preaching tonight is true because of history. We know that what I'm preaching tonight is true because of the Bible. Go back and read Hebrews chapter 11. All of those that suffered and overcome great things by the grace of God. How could a man go out and lay his head down over a chopping block and have it cut off? How could a man go out and be tied to the stake and be burned to death for the, by the, uh, for the glory of God? I'll tell you how he can do it. He had some overcoming grace. Some grace that would help him. So can I just give you the points right quick and I'll let you go. Number one, and I know this ain't deep, but it's good, I think. Number one, he said, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Turn with me just for a moment, if you would, to Romans chapter number 6 and verse number 13. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. This is a new Bible, and I can't hardly find nothing in it. Pages stick together. Romans 6, verse 13. Well, let's move back to verse 12. We're talking about submitting ourselves unto God. Now, can I say this before we read this text? Submitting yourself is an act of your will. It is something that you consciously decide to do. It's not going to happen by accident. It's going to be something that you say to yourself, I am going to submit myself to God, whatever he says to me, whatever he requires of me, whatever he wants from me, Lord, I will submit myself. I will surrender myself. I want your will over my will, Lord. I will submit myself. It's an act of your will. Now let's look at this passage. He said in verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members, that is, the members of your body. That's your mouth, your eyes, your ears, your hands, your feet, your mind. Yield those things unto God as instruments of righteousness under God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. I ought to preach on that just a little while. Because there's a crowd in this day that's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. They're saying you're saved and just live however you want to live. But Paul dealt with that right here and he said, God forbid, that's not what the grace of God's all about. Boy, I'm telling you, there's a lot to preach tonight. I better, Lord, help me to narrow it down where it needs to be. 
Verse 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, and the wages of sin is death, or of obedience unto righteousness. In, in, in a sense, this passage in Romans is telling us the same thing that James says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Do you know what yielding is? You're driving, driving down the road and you come up on a yield sign. You know what that means? It means to give the right away to somebody else. You know what God's asking us to do tonight? If we want overcoming grace, then we're going to need to yield the right of way to Him. We're going to have to stop and allow God to go first. Allow Him. And did He not say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. I mean, God will take care of a whole lot if we'll just yield to Him and allow Him to go first. Boy, I wish God, the Holy Ghost, would get a hold of this, this, these young faces that I see amongst this crowd tonight and just put it in your heart that you can do it by the grace of God, that you can submit yourself and you can use your hands for the glory of God. You can use your lips and your heart and mind. God has blessed you with great treasures, ability and beauty and all of the, the abilities that God has blessed you with and you can use your members as instruments of righteousness. Don't let the devil use them for sin and ungodliness. There's a war going on and I know it's not an easy thing. I know that war's there and I know that wants there and I know we are prone to want to worldliness as well. The devil will do his best to get you in that far country as we preached last night. But by the grace of God, you don't have to do it. Submit yourself to God. It's not only an act of the will, it's also an act of faith. And I mentioned this last night. In other words, when I submit myself to God, that means that I believe that He knows what's best for me. It, I, I mean, honestly, if I were to come down, and normally I do like to get down and walk, the, you know, I like to get down there with you, but it's a long way around. I'd be skinny as a rail when I got down there. I need a little of that. But if I were to come out through these pews, oh, see, I'm used to preaching the pews, through these aisles and these chairs, and I were to come by you, and I were to look you in your eyes, and I were to ask you, do you, do you really believe that God knows best for your life? Do you really believe that he has your best interest in mind? I, I'm not kidding now. You say you believe that, but when you go out here and serve sin and yield yourselves as members, of, uh, your members as instruments of unrighteousness, you're in essence saying, I don't believe that God really has my best interest in mind. I'm going to ask you again. Do you really believe that? It's an act of faith. Say, Lord, I, I really believe that. And I pray the Holy Ghost would get a hold of every heart in this building tonight. And he would say, Lord, I really believe that. I really do, Lord. I really believe you have my best interest in heart. I really believe you know what's best. I really believe you can see down the road, Lord, and, and you know which road I need to take now. And though I don't understand it, Though it don't make a lot of sense to me right here, it will down the road. And I'm trusting it. And so, Lord, yeah, I'll submit. That's step number one. Can I say this? That when you submit yourself to God, Satan is not going to take it away in vain. He's not just going to let you go from and I hate to go back to last night, but go from the far country back to the Father without a fight. He's not just going to allow that to happen. 
And James knows that. And so under the inspiration of God, he said, when you submit yourselves, therefore, to God, you'll have to, number two, resist the devil. Because he's not going to just let you go. You know what? I, I, thought, I heard this years ago, that, that a pirate would never attack an old, beat-down, wore-out ship that had no value to it. You know who the, old, the pirate wants to attack? He wants to attack the boat that's loaded down with the goods. With the gold and the silver and the treasure. And listen. The reason Satan wants to fight your young life. Is because he knows you're laden down with treasure. That can bring glory to God. That God has blessed you with substance as we preached last night. And he's loaded you down. And you've got something that can bring glory to God. And he's going to do everything in his power to take that if he can. Resisting has to do with, with not yielding. We do yield ourselves unto God, but resist. I mean, when you resist arrest, what do you do? You fight against it. You don't yield to it. You don't go peacefully. We ought to say tonight, if the devil's going to get me in a far country, he's going to have to drag me there, kicking and screaming. And he'll never be able to do it if you'll submit yourself to God. He'll give you more grace if you'll submit yourself to God and resist the devil, he promises you in this passage that if you resist, he will flee from you. He'll run away. But you've got to submit. And you've got to resist. Can I say this to you tonight? You can, you can, by the grace of God, overcome the wicked one. Will you turn with me just for a second to 1 John chapter 2? I'm not preaching out of a series of Roebuck. <coughs> I get this preached out of me tonight. Maybe. First John chapter 2. Verse number 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. 1 John 2, 13. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men. Those same young men that had overcome the wicked one, he says, because you are strong. Can I say they're strong spiritually? It's not because they're strong physically. I mean, you got people out here, they could wrestle a bear, and they think they're big and bad. You know how they are when they're about 18, 19, young men. That's why, that's why when they draft, they don't draft 46-year-olds. Because the sergeant said, take that heel, all them machine guns pointing down through there. And a 46-year-old says, ain't no way, you take that heel. An 18-year-old says, I think I, I think I can take it. See what I'm getting at? 18-year-old says, I, I got this. Y'all just watch this, boys. They're strong physically, but there's so many in this day who are weak spiritually. And they're not overcoming because they're strong physically. They overcome because they're strong spiritually. And he gives us another key to it right here. 
He says, and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. You know what that tells me? You can resist the devil. You can overcome the wicked one. By the grace of God that he'll give you, that if you let the word of God abide in you, dwell in you, live in you, grow in you, do something in you, you can overcome the wicked one. Others have done it. Turn back with me a few pages to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse number 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Did you catch that? Peter tells us the same thing James tells us. Resist him. Whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. John told us in chapter 2 that those young men had overcome the wicked one. Now Peter tells us that we can resist him. We better beware of him. We can resist him. And he said when you do resist him in the faith, here's something you need to know. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You know what that tells me? Peter's saying when you resist him, you just remember this. There are others in the world that are going through and have been through the exact same thing you are going through and have been through. And they accomplished that resistance. They made it by the grace of God. They overcame by the grace of God. They weren't devoured by the roaring lion. They weren't de destroyed by him. And I'm telling you, the devil says, you're the only one that's having to go through this. You're the only one that's got it this bad. You're the only one that's facing the fight like this. You're the only one that's facing these desires. You're the only one that's facing these temptations. You're the only one that Satan has approached in this manner. But that's a lie. Peter said that there's other people in the world that have been through what you're going through. And by the grace of God, he overcame the wicked here. Let's go back to John. I mean James, excuse me. The grace that overcomes is given to those that submit to God and resist the devil. And number three, draw nigh to God. And the Bible says he'll draw nigh to you. And I believe he tells us in these next phrases how we draw nigh to God. We cleanse our hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, <clears throat> you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now let's think about that. We know what cleansing, I think, means. We we, we, don't, we don't involve our members in the things of the world. We clean our life up. 
It's our responsibility. And I'll say this again, if you're old enough to be saved, you're old enough to be spiritual. It's yours. He didn't say, go let somebody else cleanse your head. He said, you cleanse your head. And you purify your heart. And here's the word. You double-minded. If you want to turn with me to Psalm 24. Just for a moment. Now we're talking about drawing nigh to God. Who is it that can draw nigh to God? It's those who begin to cleanse their hands and purify their hearts. Now listen to what the psalmist said, Psalm 24, 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? I'll tell you who he says. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceit. We're talking about some qualifications to getting close to God. Drawing nigh to God. Let me just touch on this. Pure, you're, you're purifying your hearts, he said. You're double-minded. You know what double-minded is? It means two-spirited. And, and the teaching and the, the truth of it is that that we've got people, in fact, really it goes back all the way up to verse number four. This double-mindedness is that I, I really enjoy the world, but, but I really want to be close to God. Our heart is divided. Our heart is, is, is pulled in two directions. And that's what he's saying. Purify your heart, you double-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable all the way. I mean, you get out in the middle of the road, that's the most dangerous place to be. Um, we need to get on, on one side of the fence or the other. You know what I'm saying? Get in or get out. And Lord, I hate, I hate you take the advice to get out. Just get all the way in. In you know, the most miserable Christian is the one that's double-minded. That's pulled both ways. You, you, I wish I could tell you what you could enjoy if you just get all the way in. But if we're going to draw nigh to God, we're going to have to get our minds single, our eyes set upon Him, and not be drawn by this world, not be pulled uh, to get our affections out of the world. Uh, John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And he tells us why. He said, all that's going to pass away anyway. There's so much I want to preach. I'll never get around to it all. Right? Why not love this world? Why, why can't we be double-minded? I mean, the world's going to pass away, he said, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Why would you want to love something that's just temporary? It's going to burn one of these days. Why devote your heart, your life? Why devote all your resources? I mean, there's mamas and daddies today that are sacrificing their families and their children on the altar of success. Sad. And all they're going to gain, and they're not going to take a dime of it with them. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but right? the Lord does. Double mindedness. Thinking of verse number four, then, uh, being a, a friend of the world is being an enemy of God. You know what that should do to us? It should cause us to be afflicted, verse nine, and to mourn. And to weep. You remember I said, and I pointed this out last night, that the merriness came after the mourning. I, and I even referred to this passage. I even said James told us about that. What he's saying is, instead of the, the problem now is that the that too many of God's people are just. Man, they're just married and giving them marriage and they're just enjoying life and just having a big time and they're just wasting their days. He's saying, look, 
If you're not close to God, if you're not where you need to be with God, there needs to be weeping and mourning in our hearts. We need to get right with God. Then a joy comes after the mourning. After we see the, the, the fruit, if you will. And he, he goes on to tell us that he shall lift us up. We'll hum humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt us in due time. Let us humble now. Let us weep now. Let us mourn over our condition now. That is the problem in the Laodicean church. We're not mourning over the shape that we're in. We're just having programs and replacing the power of God. Or trying to. We're just trying to go through the motions. Replacing the power of the Spirit of God. With programs and feasts and everything else. And that's why you have a big cookout and man, they'll slam the place full. You have a tent meeting and you can't hardly get them to come. You know why that is? Because they're trying, they're, they've got everything out of order. They're trying to get the joy and the happiness before the mourning and the weeping over where they're at. But you get you get the, the horse in front of the cart and business will pick up. I'm from the farm. I feel right at home up here, matter of fact. I was raised on a farm in Western North Carolina. Papa made molasses for everybody in the community. I know what a pummy pile is. I know how to run the, the cane through the mill. I know what the skimmings are. We used to make our own apple cider. I got a picture of me. I can pick a chicken with the best of them. I got a picture. I'm in a, I kind of got, I think, caught in a generation gap. I got a picture of me standing in the road going over to the barn where we burn the feathers in football pants and a practice jersey picking a chicken. So I feel right at home up here amongst all this country. I have no idea why I told you that. But at least I got your attention now. But I'm saying that we need to get, and I know why now. I'm from the farm and I know the, ho the horse goes in front of the cart. But we got it all messed up now. If you want to draw nigh to God, cleanse your hands, purify your heart, and quit being double-minded, mourn over your condition and weep over your condition. And when you start taking a step toward God, he said, I'll take a step toward you. And son, business picks up in a hurry like that. Man, it makes chill bumps run all over me. Some of you want to be popular in school. You want to be popular in the world, have your name in bright lights and bold letters. You want to be the popular one at school. But I'll tell you, me in my heart, if I could just know that God would take a step in my direction, if I could just take a step toward him and know that he'd take a step in my direction, that would thrill me as much as anything I know. Now I'll tell you, friend, he has promised us in this text that if you will draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Do you believe that tonight? You know what I think? As I look across your faces, I see some of you tonight, and I see in your face. Yeah, preacher, I mean, you're there. You can almost see it like me. You, you can, you, you, you're saying in your heart, oh, boy, that, that's a wonderful thought. Boy, just to know God's taking a step in my direction. But that's not the case with everybody's countenance, right? I feel like there's some of you, and you're sitting there, and you're hearing what I'm saying, but that has no appeal to you whatsoever. I pray the Spirit of God would put a hunger and a thirst in you that only God could quench. That he would be your goal in life. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. And lastly. Really he starts with this in verse 6. And then he ends with this in verse 10. The fourth thing. 
is to humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Because it's the only way. I said we'd get back to this in verse 6. He said, God resisteth the proud. You know what resisteth means? To stand against. To set in battle array against. It means to oppose. If we sit there in our pride, and will not humble ourselves. God's word says. He will set himself in battle array against us. He will oppose us. Now the world. The devil has got the world believing. That God is just an old man in a rocking chair. That just loves everybody. And going to just accept everything. Now, he does love everybody, thank God. But you better get that thought of God out of your head. That's not the Bible thought. He's angry with the wicked every day. I don't want God resisting me because of the pride of my heart. God resists the proud. I think I'm going to touch on this. You know what I believe that God put in my heart today? That if just a few of us would get it. I mean would get it. That only God knows what could happen in the days to come. I know this is not the same context, but the Bible does say, talking about a fire, talking about the tongue, but how he said, how great a matter a little fire kindled. Now think about this. There's some of you that's been here every night this week, and I commend you for that. But if you're not careful, You'll come to church Sunday morning. And the crowd that's not been here any this week. You'll have just a little cry in your heart. Somehow thinking that, you know, well, I'm just a little more spiritual. Than everybody else. Look, I've been around a day or two. I know me. I know how I am. I, I'll preach to myself. Maybe you're not like that, but I'd have a tendency to go in there and say, just try to get right to God and we'd have a Bible around here. Like somehow or another, I am and I'm above them and now I've got pride in my heart. You understand what I'm saying? But if we would come in in humility, doing what God said for us to do, you might be the spark that sets this church afire for the glory of God. You might be the spark that starts a revival in your school, among your young people, among your youth group. You could be the one. Because by the grace of God, you can overcome. By the grace of God, you can be different. But we'll have to submit ourselves, resist the devil, draw nigh to God, and humble ourselves. And by the way, this message tonight is for you. I'm not preaching to the crowd that's not here. You say you need to. Well, that may be true. But God sent the message for you. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm telling you, God put it on my heart for the service tonight. And God knew you and I were going to be in it. It's not for the crowd. It's not here. We're the ones that need this passage. I 
I wasn't here Monday night. But I was here Tuesday night. And if you'll keep the vows that you made to God. And you'll take spiritual things seriously Wednesday night. And you'll get out of or stay out of the far country Thursday night. And you'll seek overcoming grace by following the recipe that God has given us. You could be the one that could start the revival in our midst. Let's stand our feet. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed just for a moment. Sister, I don't know if the piano works. If it does, you can come get on it. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'd ask you to mind God tonight. If God has spoke to your heart, would you come? Would you say, preacher, I know those battles. I know those struggles. I know that warfare you're talking about. I need that overcoming grace. Would you make the first move for this altar as she begins to play tonight? Who will be the one to say, I need that overcoming grace? I want to be, I want to dare to be different. I know the struggle. They may be some of you. You've been right on the verge of being pulled right out of your own. Maybe being unfaithful to your spouse. Maybe doing something that would mark and scar the rest of your life. You've been right on the verge. And tonight God spoke to your heart. And you need to come. While these are in this altar, folks are coming from all portions of the tent tonight. Won't you come tonight? Does it excite you to think if I just take one step toward God, He'd take a step toward me? Won't you come? What about it, young people? I know you're facing struggles, and I know you're facing difficulties. And I know the devil's real, and I know the world's trying to draw you away. But I'm telling you, God's grace is sufficient to help you overcome, to help you go out of this world in a blaze of glory. You don't have to hang your head in shame because of, you got your life messed up and in sin and ungodliness. We can stand before God one day and not have to hang our head in shame, but it'll only be by the grace of God. Won't you come tonight? You could be the one, the very one that it starts in. I tell you, if you come in here on Sunday morning, full of the Holy Ghost and God touches you, I, I tell you, people that, that weren't here, they're going to say, man, what I miss out on. Man, what, what did God do? I missed out. I wonder if people want what we've got. You let God scrooge up to you real good. And this world will be wanting. They would want to know what's wrong with you, first of all. But they're going to say, man, whatever it is you've got, I want some of it. Folks are still coming tonight. Won't you come? Overcoming grace. Amazing grace. Grace that is great. Sin killing, holy living. Grace. You come.
for the red message. Look, we can still bring you at the altar if you need to come. Just go about any time. It's been a great week. Let me just say, we leave tonight without getting, bit, getting doing business with the Lord. Not being drawn close to Him as we should. We missed out. Well, but thank God for the opportunity we have to get close to Him. I'm, I think some folks got close to Him this week. I really do. Each night we've had people around the altar. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> Anybody else need to come? We'll have time. The time church is the only thing that we're hurrying into and want to hurry out of. Everything else, we're all right if it goes into overtime. It's been a good week, folks, I'm telling you. Appreciate the message tonight from Brother Robert. Really. Another great job tonight. The Lord's really used him. He's anointed and he's touched him this week. In the midst of his not feeling well. Thank God you still get the victory. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank God and bless those that put forth an effort. Pray for these that still at the altar. We have time to come. I'm wondering tonight if it's here while we wait for a moment. If there's any other tent to say, Preacher, I got a need. I want to raise my hand and ask that these people pray for me. You got a need tonight in your life. God knows about it. Amen. Just lift it up. Don't be ashamed. Hey, God bless each and every one of you. Pray for these folks that have needs in their life. Lift them up to Jesus. We didn't know until everybody saying it. We didn't know everybody saying The Lord sees the hands that were great. Anybody here tonight that's not saved, don't leave this building. Don't leave this building, this tent. Don't leave it. Tonight lost. Leave tonight knowing 100% that you know that you're saved by the grace of God. When you leave this life, you're going to heaven. Amen. Anybody else need to come? Well, I do appreciate you coming tonight. We're certainly glad to have our visitors with us tonight. Pray for Dustin. He still has some issues with his health. So keep him in your prayers. And other requests that you mentioned this week. I appreciate the opportunity we've had to be here this week. Like I said, the Lord's been good to us. Give us some good meetings, some good preaching. Thank you for it, and I pray that we'll, we'll still not go we'll over from here. I pray it'll just blossom and grow where we're at right now. Amen. If you go home tonight, be careful, especially leaving the driveway. Be careful down that road. There's a lot of traffic on that road, and some people don't pay attention, so you be sure to pay attention when you pull out. Tonight, I would ask you, if you, if you would, uh, those that would, just take the chairs that you're sitting in. If you take time to fold them up. And just lean them against the tent post. You can lean them on the middle tent post here or the outside tent post. And that'll save us a little time in the morning. We take the tent down. If you take time to do that. Now, don't take, don't jerk one up when somebody's sitting in there. <laughs> don't jerk one up if somebody else might sit down behind you. know, like you get it up. So be careful. Uh, so maybe get the one you're sitting in and we'll get the other one uh, a little bit later, okay? But I do appreciate you coming. It's been a great week. Thank you, Brother Robert, for coming and preaching to us this week. It's been a real blessing. Thank you so much. Also, thank you, Brother Barry Spears, and also, Brother Tim Riggs, and the blessing they was. Thank you, Brother John Lancaster, and your family for coming and singing for us. Dick family, thank you all for coming and singing for us. What a blessing it was. We're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer. We're going to ask the Lord's blessing to be upon us and dismiss. But you be careful. Brother Robert Thomas, you be dismissed this week.